Senator Garn's shuttle launch, skydiving, controlling your car. Our friend Newton understood it all, and you will too, on Science Without Walls. We're beginning to learn the rules of the game. That's what physics is, the rules of our natural world. Inertia is one, and gravity is another. Newton did many experiments dealing with projectiles, trying to combine horizontal motion and vertical motion. Let's assume you're standing on a tower on Mount Everest, and you start throwing balls. The first one, you let fall nearly straight down. The second one you throw with some horizontal velocity, and it moves at that horizontal velocity. It's headed straight towards outer space, but the gravitational attraction of the planet pulls it down with that constant acceleration, and it finally smashes into the surface of the Earth. If you threw the next balls harder and faster, they would go further because of their higher horizontal velocity. But they would take the same amount of time to hit the surface of the Earth. And if you threw still harder, the ball would go even faster, and the same thing would happen. It's like a skydiver trying to jump out of an airplane. The airplane's going maybe 200 miles an hour. The skydiver sees a target right below, and he jumps. Assuming no winds, he gets pulled straight down. And when he finally makes contact with the ground, he finds that he's a very long distance from that target. Assuming the airplane had continued to fly straight at the same velocity, our skydiver would look up and see the airplane right overhead. His horizontal velocity, neglecting air resistance, was the same as the airplane's when he jumped. So both he and the plane continued at the same horizontal velocity. He was continuing to go horizontally at the same rate until his path collided with the Earth's surface. If our skydiver, a female now, had rollerblades and landed on a nice smooth runway at touchdown, neglecting all friction and air resistance, she would be traveling horizontally on those rollerblades at exactly the same velocity that the airplane had when she jumped. Let's get back to throwing balls from Mount Everest. If you could throw the ball fast enough, the horizontal motion could be so fast, so long, that the ball never comes back to Earth. Its horizontal motion is altered by gravitational attraction. It's always falling towards the Earth by gravity, and it's always trying to careen into outer space. And those two tendencies are just balanced. That's exactly how we orbit satellites and space shuttles. If you would throw too hard, off into space it will go. Newton recognized that gravity, though, isn't the only force which can produce acceleration. Any force can produce an acceleration or deacceleration. So he formulated his second basic law of motion, F equals ma, or better, a acceleration equals F divided by M. The acceleration of something is basically the force acting on it divided by its mass. Remember that basically the mass is inertia. So the greater the mass, the greater the force needed to overcome that inertia, that tendency to not change. And that's Newton's first law. You're already very familiar with his third law, the action-reaction law. And of course, the best way to experience that one is again on black ice, <laughs> or rollerblades, or on ice skates, where friction is minimized. You push on the wall, the wall pushes back. Our everyday experience with the third law is mainly a consequence of how atoms and molecules are bonded and organized in solids. 
You experience Newton's three laws of motion every day. You put them to work for you when you walk, run, swim, ski, drive, go to work. Newton's universe was like a machine, like a clock, with everything controlled and balanced. One of the great mysteries that came out of Newton's brilliant work was the question of action or forces at a distance. How does gravity actually work? How can the moon, nearly 400,000 kilometers away, feel the presence of the Earth? How can the Earth feel the presence of the sun? You experience other action at a distance as well. How can one magnet feel the presence of another magnet, a millimeter, a centimeter, even a foot away? This whole idea of action or forces at a distance, particularly when that distance is the vacuum of outer space, is still a mystery, at least to most non-physicists. Why and how did gravity develop? Why do masses have gravitational properties? Good questions. We do know that gravity, inertia, mass, velocity, and acceleration exist, and that Newton's laws of motions and gravity are valid throughout the universe. Newton's three laws of motions are so basic, so fundamental, that we can use them to develop other useful laws, the conservation laws. Each of Newton's laws of motion requires conservation of mass. We already know that the basic indivisible unit of nearly all stuff is the atom. Atoms make up all common stuff in our natural world. We're going to assume for now that atoms are indestructible. We know that they can exchange electrons and make molecules, but basically the entire mass of the atom is in the nucleus, and we'll assume the nucleus is indestructible. For now, we can ignore nuclear fission or fusion. If we make that assumption, then mass is conserved. We can't destroy any of it. We can grind things up, make powders, make solids into gases, and all of that. But fundamentally, the basic unit or building block is the atom. We can't destroy it or break it down any further. So when we count up all the atoms, we have the same number at the end of any experiment or process as at the beginning. Oh, you might misplace a few and find that they are hard to find, but you know deep down inside that they're there. It's like losing puzzle pieces or even losing your keys. Although they're lost, you know that they still exist somewhere. Mass is conserved. Mass is neither created nor destroyed. In order for inertia and action-reaction to work, conservation of mass has to be valid. There are other conservation laws that derive from Newton's laws of motion. Conservation of momentum and conservation of angular momentum. But we just don't have time to cover them here. You'll get to them in a physics course. But we must cover conservation of energy. There is energy associated with motion. We call it kinetic energy. There is also energy associated with gravity and position, and we call that potential energy. When we hold up a ball, we have used energy to lift it up against gravity. So we say it has some energy potential, a potential energy. That energy is really only expressed when it is let go and gravity acts on it, accelerating it, causing its velocity to increase. As it falls, it transforms gravitational potential energy to motion, to kinetic energy. So when we say energy is conserved, we mean this kinetic energy and this potential energy together are conserved. Another example is a ball on a circular track. Down, acceleration, faster, lots of kinetic energy, then up, slower, to a stop, lots of potential energy again. In this little hanging ball device, we convert potential energy to kinetic energy, and then the kinetic energy back to potential energy, and back again, and again, and again. Different forms of energy can be transformed or changed from one to another, but energy is conserved in those processes.
Whoa, you say. You can't tell me that the energy is conserved, that the total of the potential energy and the kinetic energy stays a constant, and yet I see that the bouncing balls don't bounce forever. The motion dies out. Well, you're right, and you already know why. It's due to that major principle of science, one that Newton, in all of his brilliance, did not fully recognize or maybe have time to work on. And that's whenever we transform energy from one form to another, we discover that energy conversion or transformation is never 100% efficient, at least not in our everyday world. Some of the energy becomes unusable, inaccessible, Yes, it is that non-conservation law from Program 8, the Entropy Principle. Why does energy become inaccessible? Because it's been transformed to heat. The problem is that when energy gets transformed to heat, it's almost always impossible to get it back in any useful or practical form. Heat flows, dissipates. Remember our hot and cold blocks? Practically all energy transformation produces heat, and generally that heat is not usable, and that is inefficiency. So the energy is conserved, it's all there, but the part there is heat is often not very useful. In order to understand these losses, we have to figure out what is heat, and for that we have to go back to atoms and molecules. There are different kinds of molecules in the air oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide. There are also water molecules in the air. And if there's a lot of water in the air, you know that it can be condensed out as rain under the right set of conditions. And we have liquid water. If it gets even colder, liquid water forms a hard, rigid solid, ice. And you know that these three types of matter, vapor, liquid, and solid, contain exactly the same molecules, water in this case, but generally at different temperatures. We already know the temperature scales exist, that some things are hotter than others. We also know we can pour liquids and they'll move by themselves, downhill. Molecules in vapor seem to move around all over the place. These facts, these observations, all tie together in our everyday world. The state of a molecule, whether it's liquid, vapor, or solid, is mainly due to its temperature. Atoms and molecules have energy. The energy they have, their temperature, is really their motion, their kinetic energy. Molecules in the gas state are very energetic in constant rapid motion. Here, we've put some water and air in a balloon and tied it very tightly. The molecules inside can't get out, and the molecules outside can't get in. It's a closed system, but it's not closed to energy. We can heat up the water molecules inside to a high temperature using a microwave. The microwave energy travels into the balloon, heating up the water, and two things happen. The now hot water partially vaporizes, and the water vapor molecules themselves get hotter. They have a higher kinetic energy, so the balloon expands. Those molecules inside becoming hotter increases their pressure. If the water molecules were to be cooled, the pressure would decrease. The balloon would get smaller, like it was before we heated it. So pressure, temperature, and heat are all essentially the same thing, all due to the disorganized motion of atoms and molecules. To make a long story short, each molecule in the vapor or gas has kinetic energy. It's traveling at a pretty rapid clip. At room temperature, in normal air, oxygen and nitrogen molecules are traveling at about a thousand miles an hour. When they're hotter, they travel faster. And when cooler, they travel more slowly. At these speeds, they can't travel very far before they run into a wall, like the inner surface of the balloon. The collisions they make with the wall is the pressure, and heat is the motion of individual atoms or molecules. These little white balls are a metaphorical representation of highly magnified atoms or molecules. 
They're ordered and compact, like this at low temperature. We simulate putting heat into this solid by shaking the system, vibrating the atoms, like this. If they get hot enough, the vibration, the energy, will overcome the attractive forces between the atoms and the solid structure disrupts. It has melted. At that temperature and above, the white atoms are much more dynamic, more disordered. They are constantly colliding and running into each other. This is an analogy for the transition from ice to liquid water. Putting even more energy into this system, the balls vibrate more and more, giving each atom or molecule more and more kinetic energy until they break free from one another and get launched into the vapor. Then we say the liquid has transformed into vapor. It is boiling. Temperature, heat, the vibration and motions of atoms, and the states of matter, solid, liquid, or gas, are all connected, all due to the same processes. Almost every energy conversion process, almost all work, results in heat. That's why cars have radiators, that's why you sweat, that's why your car tires get hot, that's why everything that works, every energy source, gets warm. That warmth, that heat, is not generally useful. It is inefficiency. Heat only flows from hot to cold. Yes, we have refrigerators, which actually pump heat out, so heat is flowing from cold to hot, but it takes energy to do that. It's an inefficient process. Refrigeration and air conditioning don't happen spontaneously in nature. In nature, heat flows from hot to cold, spontaneously, naturally, no help required. It's like water flowing downhill. We never see water spontaneously go uphill. Sure, it gets up there eventually, but that's through the climate processes, rain, snow, evaporation. And remember, they're all driven by solar energy. So if there's no energy available to drive such uphill processes, then the only spontaneous processes we have are water flowing down, heat flowing down. So there's a one-way path for most natural processes. This directionality to natural processes in our universe is the second law of thermodynamics. The first law was conservation of energy. Energy is always conserved, although some of it leaks out in the form of heat and is dissipated. So although all the energy is conserved, useful or practical energy, which the physicists define as the ability to do work, is not conserved. And that is the second law. More formally, the second law says, in any energy transformation process, there is an inherent dissipation of some of that energy, generally in the form of heat. And that energy is no longer available for useful purposes. You already know we call this entropy. The second law of thermodynamics says that all processes are inefficient, at least in our everyday world, that in order to keep things going, you have to continue to input some energy in order to continue to produce entropy. So everything that we do, every energy conversion that we make, all work that we do, all machines we use, all produce, all make entropy. Entropy is the heat produced. So another way to state the second law is that entropy is never conserved. Entropy always increases. There is a third law of thermodynamics, which says we can never get to absolute zero, the total absence of all heat, the absence of all atomic and molecular motion. It's really based on the second law, because to get to absolute zero, we have to take all heat out of the system. Well, if you're trying to produce the coldest thing anywhere, then you have to move that heat uphill. That is, you have to make somewhere else hotter. And you can't do that without producing more heat because all such processes are inefficient. So you're kind of in a circular argument. The result is the third law. You just can't do it. So here are the three laws of thermodynamics. One, you can't get something for nothing. That's the conservation of energy law. Two, 
you can't even break even. You always lose. That's the maximization of entropy law. And three, you can't get there from here. That is, we can't achieve absolute zero, the total absence of all heat. Well, these laws are absolutely fundamental to all of science, and they appear to work throughout our universe. Okay, now, before you start pelting me with tomatoes and suggesting all kinds of exceptions, let me just remind you of our discussion of system. Be sure you consider the system. Remember, when you look at a refrigerator or a freezer, it's not fair to just look inside. The heat is being pumped to the room through the coils in the back or in the bottom of the unit. The same with your air conditioner. Sure, it's getting colder on one side, but it's certainly getting hotter on the other side. And look at all the electricity being consumed. Lots of entropy is being produced, especially back at the electrical generating plant. So sorry, we can't even break even. So the second law of thermodynamics, the law of increasing entropy, provides a great philosophical rationalization for much of our own personal and even social inefficiencies. Entropy happens. Things get disordered, mixed up, randomized. The reverse of that, spontaneous ordering, never happens. It only happens if we run the tape backwards. It's an illusion. So when you look at your messy desk, or messy room, or even messy hair, you can say that these are indeed natural tendencies of the universe, manifestations of the second law of thermodynamics. Enjoy this new excuse to help keep you from getting more organized. See you next time. Turn.